Okay, um, how many of you have heard the expression, God helps those who help themselves? Put your hand up if you've heard that expression. Okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> next question, how many of you, or who can tell me where that appears in the Bible? Nowhere, good, you guys are so on top of things, this is great. Yeah, it is a trick question. Um, God helps those who help themselves is not in the Bible. Uh, and yet it has become such a just common sense sort of saying that something like 50% of Christians who are serving think it's in the Bible and some 80% of um, people generally also think that it's in the Bible. Um, is it true though? Is, is it true that, that God helps those who, helps, who help themselves? Um, to be completely honest, it kind of depends what you mean by God helps those who help themselves. Um, if you mean by that, that God helps um, people who take the resources and abilities that he has given them and put them to good, responsible use, then yeah, I guess, in a sense, God helps those who help themselves. Um, he has given us wisdom and, and, and strength and, and resources, and, and he does intend for us to make responsible use of those things. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of this old story you've probably heard before. Um, you know, there, there's a flood, and to escape the flood, this guy goes up onto the roof of his house, um, and he says, he, he prays, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm trusting you to save me. And uh, a few minutes later, um, a guy in a rowboat rows up to him and says, hop in and we'll get you to safety. And the guy says, no, I'm praying that the Lord will deliver me and I'm confident that he will. Okay, a few minutes later, a guy in a motorboat goes by and says, okay, um, jump in and I'll get you to safety. And of course, um, he says, well, no, I'm praying that the Lord will deliver me and I'm confident that he will. Um, and um, so I'm just going to stay here. Off the motorboat goes and then a helicopter flies over and drops the rope and says, hey, climb up, we will get you to safety. And the guy says, well, no, I am praying that the Lord will save me and I am absolutely certain that he will. Uh, and so the helicopter goes by. Um, uh, eventually the water keeps rising and the guy drowns. Uh, and he goes up and stands before the Lord and he says, Lord, I prayed that you would save me and I was confident that you saved me and you did not save me. And God, of course, says, well, I sent you a rowboat and a motorboat and a helicopter. What more did you want? God intends for us to make use of the things that he gives to us. And in that way, I guess you could say that God helps people who make responsible use of the things that he has provided. Um, I don't think, though, that that's what people mean when they say God helps those who help themselves today. <laughs> Like, I think that if you were to ask a person what that means, they would probably say something like, don't wait for God, just get out and do it yourself. Or um, take the initiative, pursue your own agenda, and God will get on board and help you to succeed with your plans. Um, the the, the, the freedictionary.com says, God will assist people who are already putting forth effort towards something without relying solely on divine intervention. Uh, in, in short, God helps those who take matters into their own hands. I think that's kind of what people mean. You have heard it said, God helps those who help themselves. Is it true? What, what would Jesus say? To answer that question, I want to take you to the Gospel of John. Um, so turn with me to the Gospel of John. Um, John chapter 5, go halfway and then go about halfway again. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You'll find our story there. John 5, verse 1. Uh, John 5, verse 1 is where we're going to start. Uh, at this point, Jesus has been um, out in the countryside, ministering to people uh, out in the fields and the byways and lanes. And um, he decides, well, now I'm going to go into the big city. And so in John chapter 5, we find him there in Jerusalem. Uh, John 5, chapter 1, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jewish people. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. It was covered with five, um, surrounded by five covered colonnades. Um, that's true, they found archaeological evidence of that pool with five colonnades, you can go and see it. 
Um, here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the, the blind and the lame and, and the paralyzed. This must have been a, a tragic sight to see, right? All of these people marginalized by society, each one suffering in his own way, laid out around the edge of, of this pool. Now, um, if you're looking really closely at your Bible, you're going to notice um, something's missing here. Verse 4 is probably not in your Bible, uh, unless you're using a King James Version um, of the Bible. Uh, the long story short of this is that um, when the... Um, let me just put everybody on mute here. When the um, King James Version... Uh, no, what do I want to say? Um, yeah, when, when King James, uh, when earlier versions of the Bible were, were translated, before there were, um, no, after there were letters and numbers, this is not going well. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, when the chapter and verse numbers were added to the Bible, verse 4 was there. In, in, in the earliest manuscripts that they had, verse 4 was there, uh, and, and so that's why it's in the King James Version and, and others. Um, since then, we've discovered older manuscripts, which are closer to the original manuscripts that John, in this case, would have written. Uh, and they discovered, oh, wait, that line is not actually there in what John wrote. Um, so rather than throw off the numbering, they've just left that um, four verse out of it. Um, but I can kind of understand why somebody added in verse four, because it kind of explains why all of these people are choosing to lie there on the side of the pool all day long, because this is not a resort. They don't have poolside bar service here. Um, apparently, they believed that an angel would come down every once in a while and, and, and stir the water. And, and when they saw that happen, ev everybody in their various disabled states would try to get themselves into the water because the first person who managed to plunge in apparently would, would be healed from whatever they were suffering from. Now, um, if it was true that God helps those who, helps themsel who help themselves, then this would be the end of the story. God would help the person who got in first. Case closed. But, verse 5, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. 38 years this guy's been disabled. Um, think back to 1986. That was... 38 years ago. Um, did anybody go to Expo 86 in Vancouver? I kind of think Don and, did Barb, did you and Don go? I have a memory of that. What's that? Pamela went. Yeah, I knew there was a connection. Uh, Expo 86 happened in 86, obviously. Uh, the shuttle, uh, the Challenger exploded. Chernobyl happened in 1986. Think about all that you've experienced since that time. This man has been unable to get around since then. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? <laughs> Which I'm sure the guy in his, set, in his head said, yeah, duh, of course I want to get well. But he handled it with a bit more tact. Uh, verse 7, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the water when the pool is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, somebody always gets there ahead of me. Apparently other people had um, friends or family that would help them to get in, but this man had no one to help him. He was helpless to help himself. If God helps only those who help themselves, then this guy is out of luck. Then, verse 8, Jesus said, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked away. Out of all the people at the pool that day, who did God in Jesus choose to help? The one who got into the pool first, who helped himself and made uh, the effort to win an award, his reward? No, God chose to, to help the person who could not help himself. 
I mean, the man says so in verse 7, I have nobody to help me get into the pool, so I can't get in there. God chose to help a man who could not help himself. And it's not like this is the only time that God acts like this. Um, flip ahead to John 6. John 6, 18, you've got uh, disciples being tossed about helplessly in a storm. What does God do? He stills the storm, thus helping those who can't help themselves. Jump ahead again, John 9. You've got a man who was born blind. He is helpless to help himself. What does God do about it? He heals the man's blindness, thus helping the one who could not help himself. <laughs> You're going to hate me. Flip again, two chapters ahead. John chapter 11, you've got Lazarus laid out dead in his grave, very much unable to help himself. And what does God do? He raises the man back to life and helps the one who can't help himself. God has a habit of helping the people that can't help themselves. That's why the, the Bible again and again um, attests to the fact that God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. That's, that's Psalm 68, 5. Uh, it's why Isaiah talks about God as being a refuge for the helpless and the needy in distress. It's why Paul says in, John, uh, in, in, um, in Romans 5, 6, uh, at just the right time, when we were still helpless, Christ uh, died for the ungodly. You have heard it said, God helps those who help themselves, but I would say to you, God helps those who can't help themselves. A.W. Pink, um, who was a, an influential pastor in the 20s and 30s, um, he, he put it like this, to, to declare that God helps those who help themselves is to repudiate one of the most precious truths taught in the Bible and in the Bible alone, namely that God helps those who are unable to help themselves, who have tried time and time again only to fail. That applies when it comes to health, that applies when it comes to work, that applies when it comes to salvation. God helps people who cannot help themselves. But let's take it a step further, because we have already said that, you know, God doesn't intend for us to just let the rowboat and the motorboat and the helicopter pass us by. He doesn't want us sitting around waiting. Um, <clears throat> what do we do with this knowledge that God helps those who can't help themselves? To be honest, I think it really comes down to the um, definition that I read to you earlier from the freedictionary.com. Um, normally, I would not highlight freedictionary.com as a great source for academic research. <laughs> However, in this case, I think that they have said something very insightful. According to the idioms section of freedictionary.com, God helps those who help themselves means God will assist people who are already putting forth effort towards something without relying on divine intervention. That, that's the key. Without relying on divine intervention. When most people say God helps those who help themselves, what they're saying is God helps those who rely on themselves. God helps those who trust themselves and who put their own agenda before God. Frankly, I think when most people say God helps those who help themselves, it's really just putting a religious veneer on people's selfish ambition to put their own goals before Jesus. That's not how God intends for it to work. God is not a genie who gets on board with your plans and blesses them. God is not an elitist kind of God who only helps the people who can afford to help themselves. God is a sovereign God who is doing this work of restoration in the whole of the world. And when we rely on him and get on board with him, he pours out that restoring work in our lives too. That's why I think we need to say not just God helps those who can't help themselves, but also God helps those who rely on him. We're not going out pursuing our own agenda, expecting God to pour his blessing on it. Um, but we're also not sitting and doing nothing. We're taking responsible steps, relying on God. And, and I actually think that we see an example of that in the passage just before John 5. So one more time, flip back to John. We're going to look at John chapter 4. Um, really good illustration, I think, real quick. John 4, 46. 
So John 4.46, um, once more, uh, Jesus visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine, <clears throat> and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. Okay, this guy is a royal official, he is a man with power at his disposal, he is a man with resources at his disposal. If there was any uh, ever a guy who could help himself, um, it's this guy, right? Um, this guy could walk up to Jesus and say, listen pal, I can give you riches beyond belief if you will just heal my son. Or he could say, you know, I can see that you're kind of causing a stir out here in the countryside. I'm going to throw you in jail until you do something to help my son out because I've got the power to do that. But look at what he says in verse 47. When, when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee uh, from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come to heal his son who was close to death. And Jesus says, unless you people see signs and miracles, uh, you'll never believe. But the royal official said, sir, please calm down before my son dies. Those are the words of a man who knows how helpless he is in this situation. He doesn't bargain, he doesn't pull rank, he simply says, Lord, I need you to do this because I can't do it. And so God helped the one who relied on him. Verse 50, Jesus replied, you may go. Your son will live. Now, here's where the rubber hits the road. Because notice, this man has no way of knowing whether or not that's true. Right? The next couple of verses tell us that this guy's a day away from home and he doesn't have a cell phone that he can tell. A cell phone? Cell phone doesn't look like this. He doesn't have a telephone that he can call and say, that's how old I am, right? Actually used a dial phone. He doesn't have any way to contact his home a day away and say, uh, Jesus says my son is okay, but is he okay? He's got a choice to make. Is he gonna rely on God and trust that Jesus really knows what he's saying? What does it say? Verse 50, the man took Jesus at his word and departed. He trusted that when Jesus said, your son is healed, his son really was healed. God helps those who rely on him, who take him at his word and, and, and trust him. You know, I think that this man absolutely took responsible action. Right? He hears that Jesus is in town. He makes his way over to him. He presents his case before him and demonstrates that he is relying on him. But when it comes right down to it, he's not trusting in his own power. He's relying on the power of God to intervene in this moment. And wouldn't you know it, verse 51, while he was still on the way, on the way home, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And, and when he acquired, inquired in, as to the time when his son got better, well, they said to him, well, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact moment when Jesus had told him, your son will live. Jesus wasn't pulling his leg here. <laughs> Jesus said he's going to live, and he did. So he and his household believed. I think that this is a good model for us to, to think about um, as we consider how to apply this in our lives, right? God helps those who can't help themselves. God helps those who rely on him. What does that look like? Well, first, just know that God helps those who can't help themselves. When you're up against something that is so big that you can't possibly see a way out of it, God knows a way out of it. God is more than willing to help to get out of it. God is a, a, a help to the helpless, a refuge for those who can't help themselves. You know, uh, every day this week as I worked on this, I thought about our, our, our friends in the hospital with rabies. Like that is a situation way beyond their ability to deal with. However, God is way beyond the ability to deal with something like that. God helps people who can't help themselves. And God helps people who rely on him, right? The, the royal official here, I think, took responsible action. Yes, he went and he put his request before the Lord. And yet in the end, he relied on him. 
God invites us to bring these things to uh, him, to lay them at his feet and to trust him to handle them. God invites us to surrender our burdens to him, to trust him with our heaviest loads and to rest in his sovereign mercy. You have heard it said, God helps those who help themselves. But I say to you, God helps those who can't help themselves, and God helps those who rely on him. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this truth. We live in such a individualistic, John Wayne, I can do it myself kind of culture. And yet, Lord, I can't do it all myself. We recognize, Lord, that, that there are things that are way above and beyond our ability to handle. And so it is a blessing to know that you, who created all things, simply by a word, you are with us, you are committed to us, and willing to help in those moments. Lord, we lift up to you right now all of those helpless situations that we see in our lives or in the lives of others that we know. We pray, Lord, that you would pour out your glorious power to help those who can't help themselves. And we pray, Lord, that you would deepen our trust in you so that we do, in every situation, rely on you. Lord, we hand over to you those things that we are trying to do in our own strength. We, we, we lay down our own selfish agendas and we say, Lord, lead, carry us along. Help us to rely on you with all that we are. Thank you, Lord, that you help us when we trust you. We pray, Lord, for your goodness and your glory in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we respond now.